Yes, Julie, can, can you hear me? We can hear you. We're thank you. Muted. Okay. Yeah. A little less there. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your patience, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to our Worldwide Lamb Awareness Month, June 2nd uh, edition of our Lamposium in Your Living Room. My name is Charlene Dunn, and I'm the Patient and Clinical Programs Director for the Lamb Foundation, and very excited to welcome you to this evening's presentation. If this is your first time joining us, you can learn more about this educational series and view recordings of previous presentations by visiting the Lamposium in Your Living Room page on the Foundation's newly updated website. A quick outline of what is ahead, we will begin this evening with a presentation from Susan Jacobs, who, in addition to her incredible work at Stanford University and Stanford Healthcare, is chair of the writing committee for the American Thoracic Society's guidelines on home oxygen and has worked tirelessly toward increasing the quantity and quality of oxygen-related patient and clinician educational resources. We will allow a few minutes for questions following Susan's presentation. Next, we will spotlight three women from our LAMP community for whom the subject of supplemental oxygen is near and dear to the heart. These ladies have compiled a video that includes a fantastic hands-on demonstration of equipment and offers relevant, creative, and incredibly insightful techniques for living with supplemental oxygen as part of your daily life. Following the video, we will again have a few minutes to address specific questions before we move into our group discussion. So a lot of information to cover, but before we do, I would like to take a moment to again th thank the National Disease Research Interchange and Pfizer for their continued support of this educational series. And quickly, a couple of housekeeping items before I turn this over to our moderator. Microphones will be muted throughout the presentations. We will open them later in the evening for the group discussion. Second, we will use the chat box for a Q&A. If you have a question for our speakers, please type it in the chat box and our moderator will then read your questions to our speakers. We do ask that you reserve the chat box for speaker questions throughout the presentations. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Beverly Jackson, our moderator this evening. Bev is one of our LAM, three LAM liaisons in region 14, which covers Arkansas, Louisiana, and Eastern Oklahoma and Texas. We will circle back and learn more about and hear from Bev later this evening. For now, Bev, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for hosting this evening, and I will now turn it over to you. Welcome everyone to the Lamposium in your living room. So glad you're able to join us for this session on supplemental oxygen, understanding and optimizing resources and systems to fit your needs. I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Susan Jacobs. Susan Jacobs, MS RN, is a research nurse manager in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine and nurse coordinator in the interstitial lung disease program at Stanford University, Stanford Healthcare. Her background includes roles as critical care nurse educator, NIH project directory for dyspnea. I cannot say that word, but all of you who have the problem know it means shortness of breath and exercise study and pulmonary rehabilitation coordinator. Susan works closely with the Pulmonary Fibrosis and LAMB Foundations and coordinates interstitial lung disease and LAMB support groups and educational seminars. Susan's clinical and research interest areas include improving quality of life issues related to oxygen use, dyspnea, and cough. She is actively involved in the American Thoracic Society ATS and chairs the oxygen special interest group. Susan is lead author on the results of the first national patient survey of almost 2,000 supplemental oxygen users in the United States, the ATS multidisciplinary oxygen workshop, and the recent home oxygen therapy for adults with chronic lung disease, ATS clinical practice guidelines. She received the National Lamb Foundation Leader Award in 2014 the Outstanding Clinician Award from the California Thoracic Society in 2016, and the John Walsh ATS PAR Award in 2019. Please welcome Susan Jacobs.
Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Thank you, Bev, for that great introduction. Bev has been a colleague and advocate for many years along the way for oxygen. Okay, so I'll spend the next uh, 30 minutes, 35 minutes, going over um, supplemental oxygen with a focus on understanding and optimizing um, resources and systems to fit your needs, which is sometimes, uh, as you know, more than I know, uh, very challenging. Just, uh, so I'll go through just first the basics. Uh, this is a, a key part of your treatment. Um, when we look at kind of the, uh, the whole management of, of pulmonary symptom management, I'm just going to change one thing here. Thank you. Uh, this, you know, you can see how treating hypoxemia is part of the whole picture. Uh, we manage symptoms by addressing education, dyspnea, chest discomfort, which in lamb patients is, is quite particular. Uh, deconditioning, we talk about pulmonary rehab, fatigue, and, and really in this same level of, of uh, attention and, and the holistic treatment management is, is really addressing hypoxemia. So just a little basics on getting that oxygen into the blood. Um, just a reminder that you take a breath in, it's gonna travel down the main airways uh, into, the, into the main um, alveoli here. And that oxygen is gonna travel all the way down to its terminal bronchus. And the, this is really where the action is in the alveolar sacs. And if we magnify it further, we can see this is where the oxygen is gonna transfer from the alveolus through the alveolar capillary membrane and into this capillary bed and that will deliver that oxygenated blood throughout your system. So in LAM, uh, we can see the causes of hypoxemia can include the destruction or loss of the alveolar capillary uh, membrane because of the cyst formation, which are actual holes throughout the lung tissue. And this can slow down the transfer of oxygen into the blood, uh, bloodstream. There's also a phenomenon we call mismatching, that the air that you breathe in may not be going to the places where the blood and the transfer of oxygen is occurring. So we call this a ventilation to perfusion mismatch, and that can contribute to hypoxemia. And other causes in patients with LAM, um, you may have pleural effusions, which actually is a collection of fluid on the outside of the long, lung and between the lung and the chest wall. And that can compress lung tissue and, and cause lower oxygen levels. And certainly if you have a lung collapse, um, certainly acutely, that can be a cause of hypoxemia. And you can see here a normal CT scan of the chest. And then here you can see the, the cyst that clearly you know, affect the lung tissue and can affect the amount of area in there for the oxygen to transfer into the bloodstream. So why do we give oxygen? We have data, um, some of it is quite old, but you can see the three most uh, prominent long-term studies. The first two were done in the early 80s. Uh, this number one is the uh, NOT trial, and this was done with patients with chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease who were hypoxemic this is the long study. And they determined their, the results confirmed that long-term oxygen 24 hours a day actually improved survival over time in the patients who had COPD. And this is important with severe resting hypoxemia. So those are patients who had low oxygen levels, which we would normally define as a saturation below 88 to 90% at rest. The second study was done about the same time. This also confirmed similar results that long-term oxygen that was used at least 15 hours a day improved survival for this group, which were a little bit sicker. They had some signs of right heart failure. And then the most recent study that was long-term, and again, these are all in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, not with LAM, uh, but again, these were patients who were randomly assigned to use oxygen or not use oxygen. And these were patients a little milder. So these patients had mild resting hypoxemia. You can see their saturations were more mildly decreased, um, or they may have just desaturated with exercise. And in this group that were randomized to receive oxygen or not, there actually was no difference in survival found at the end of the study for this particular type of patient. 
So what are the benefits of oxygen? So, you know, based on the data that we have, um, and that's not on this slide, but we know in patients with COPD, if they have low oxygen while at rest, we know that they benefit in terms of survival for using oxygen over time. Otherwise, in general, we can say that there's many studies that have documented that oxygen may, not always, it may um, decrease levels of shortness of breath, particularly with exertion. Uh, it can decrease strain on the heart. We talked about the right heart failure. Um, the right side of the heart is pumping that blood through the lung. And if that lung has fewer blood vessels or constricted blood vessels, the pressure simply backs up into that right side of the heart and puts strain on it and can have a little right heart failure. So we can see right heart uh, involvement in patients who have chronic low oxygen levels. Um, we hope that giving you oxygen will prevent pulmonary hypertension in that case, if you have resting hypoxemia. We also hope, and there is some data, that it'll increase your activity level or your exercise tolerance. And in some patients who desaturated sleep, it may improve your sleep quality as well. So how do we, uh, how do we, I'm sorry, my, I'm just gonna move something right here. So what may happen if you're prescribed oxygen, you meet the criteria, but don't use it. So understandably, you may have a higher heart rate with exertion, you may have higher respiratory rate, some pulmonary hypertension if you have resting hypoxemia. Um, but one thing I would like to point out is that we really have minimal data on patients who have normal oxygen levels at rest but they desaturate or they drop their oxygen with exercise or exertion or activity only. We don't have clear data on that. Um, so that's a hard question to answer. We, the, the data is harder to get for that. So we really don't know what kind of harm there might be for someone who has a low oxygen level a couple hours a day, for example. Um, and it's important data to capture and I'll touch on some of that later because there are some studies that are actually looking at that. So then how do we assess if you need oxygen or not? Uh, many of you have already been exposed to this. Uh, we can measure this by a forehead probe. If you have poor circulation, we can use an oximeter or we can go right to the blood and take a blood gas. Um, we can sometimes do a six minute walk or what we call exercise oximetry. Some patients are monitored in a hospital or we can do overnight oximetry in various locations. We rarely do a blood gas um, unless you're having a, we call maybe a full pulmonary function study, which we should usually include a blood gas for that. But sometimes you're in the hospital and it, if it is done, it's drawn from the radial artery in the wrist. So if you're short of breath, does it mean that your oxygen levels are low? And that's a good question. It comes up very frequently. Patients assume if they're struggling to breathe, um, that their oxygen are, levels are low, but this is not necessarily true. So you have to recall that there are many reasons for shortness of breath. Um, and in general, it can be related to the work to breathe. So if your lung in lamb, for example, has um, obstruction to that airflow because of your cystic changes in the lung, your, your physical work to move the air in and out will be higher and it tells your brain that it's uncomfortable breathing. So it's a higher work of breathing, but your oxygen levels may in fact be normal. It could be that you have uh, fluid around your lung making you short of breath. And, and not uncommonly, you can be short of breath because you're very deconditioned. Um, you know, when you're breathless, it's a very vicious cycle. When we're very short of breath, you tend to do less and avoid that breathlessness but muscle deconditioning can in fact make you uh, more short of breath for each, a given exercise. We know that carrying extra body weight uh, definitely can contribute to breathlessness. And we also know there's a very large, um, I wouldn't say large, but there's a significant component with anxiety and panic when you're feeling air hunger. So that's very, um, can be a very significant player in this. So we do test oxygen at varying, um, Conditions at rest, we can test it with activity, which could be a walk, could be stairs. Many patients tell us that the six minute walk doesn't really um, reflect the amount of intensity or different exercise they do at home. Um, so we may take you on stairs. You can do overnight pulse oximetry and importantly at altitude, which includes um, air flight, which we'll be touching on more during this session. 
So the equipment and the prescription, this is just a picture of a six minute walk. And this is really explaining how we get the, what we call the oxygen prescription. So we first check you at rest on what we call room air, the air around us, and we record that. Then we would walk you again on room air or do stairs or whatever we're gonna do. And perhaps in this person, they drop to 86%. We would, the goal is to keep you at 90% or higher. Medicare, for example, reimburses us if you reach 88% by an oximeter or lower. So we put this uh, person on two liters and they get to 87%, not quite enough. We repeat it, we do it on four liters and they get to 92%. And that would be the oxygen prescription for this patient with exertion. And at rest, they would not need oxygen. And we always remind anyone starting on oxygen to make sure they bring it their equipment with them to the clinic so that we can actually test you on your own equipment. That's very important. So we do place patients on oxygen based on data. We don't do it by, some, by symptom. So that's important to understand. We, we need that data. So what are the choices? Uh, there's three types of oxygen, and you'll hear more about this. The first being compressed gas. Those are the green tanks that you see, all sorts of sizes some that you can fill at home. The second type is concentrated oxygen, either in a large stationary concentrator or in a portable concentrator. And this pulls oxygen out of the ambient air, puts it through some uh, filters, sieve beds, pulls out nitrogen and puts out a more purified form of oxygen. And then lastly, there's liquid oxygen, which is just super cooled oxygen. Uh, and it's, it becomes a gaseous, uh, uh, form of oxygen when it's put into the portable container. Um, we can place a lot more oxygen and a liquid, you know, equivalent and a liquid canister than you can compared to either of these first two. But this is a very expensive modality. And unfortunately, because of reimbursement, we're seeing it really um, become quite rare. What type of flow? This is important to understand. You can have continuous flow that goes throughout the breathing cycle or pulse or demand flow, where the oxygen is only delivered as a bolus when you inhale and then it stops. So it delivers the bolus and then it stops during exhalation. There's different types of flow delivery. Most deliver by minute volume. And this means that no matter how fast you breathe, there's a set amount of oxygen that you will receive in a minute. So if you were breathing at a slower rate, each volume of oxygen per pulse would be a little higher. If you increase your respiratory rate, each amount of uh, the volume of oxygen in each pulse dose would be a little bit lower. Um, so that's the most common form. And we've heard now we have patients using POCs that are marketed for sleep. This is pretty new for us. Um, they say they're approved. Uh, there is actually some published data, but I would check with your physician and maybe even have some pulse oximetry overnight just to make sure, because you'll need to be triggering that device. These are pulse systems. They, they say they have this intelligent delivery technology that's quite sensitive during sleep, um, but I would discuss this with your physician first. And the other kind of key message here is to understand that a setting of four liters per minute of continuous flow on any device um, an e-cylinder or, or a stationary concentrator or liquid does not equal necessarily a setting, a number setting of four on your pulse system. So the only way to truly know if you're getting adequate oxygen is by checking your pulse oximetry. That's really the bottom line. You can't assume that if you are tested on an e-tank at four liters per minute, that you will just be fine on a pulse setting of four. You might be but it's important to check um, and confirm that with pulse oximetry. And to get even more complicated, between POCs, they may differ. So you could line up three POCs, put them all on a setting of two, and actually do a very you know, scientific measure of delivery of oxygen, and it could vary between the three POCs. And this has been published data, so it's a, an interesting, uh, challenging area. So these are the tanks. And you can see an E-tank here is the biggest one that you see around in the hospital setting, um, smaller choices. And this is a home fill where you can fill your own tank at home 
Um, they take a while to fill and there's, you know, you can't use your stationary concentrator at a high level if you're filling at the same time. So you, you really need to research this before um, accepting that. Liquid, as I said, is very rare. So we've really uh, had to, um, you know, there's a lot of advocacy work, which I can touch on later, but this is something that's really disappearing, which is a biggest loss for our high flow patient. And we would define high flow as someone who needs more than three liters a minute, continuous flow, because the POCs on the market, which is my next one here, um, none of these POCs go above three liters per minute continuous flow. So patients that have low flow needs below three are, are, can more easily use portable equipment, particularly POCs. If patients require three, four, five, six liters per minute, then it becomes very challenging. Some of these do go up to a setting of um, six, uh, and the ones that go to three continuous weigh you know, 20 pounds, so they're not very portable. And other important things, so the weight range is huge. The battery life uh, is used to concentrate the oxygen. The time to charge the battery varies. Uh, it's important to understand that continuous flow uses a battery more quickly. Higher pulse flow uses it more quickly and higher breathing rates drain the batteries more quickly. They can run off DC power, the FAA approved, but you do need a battery for one and a half times your flight. Um, it's very critical to get test it on your system before you purchase it. These systems can be three to four thousand dollars, two to four thousand dollars. So that's critical to take care of that before um, and, and, and get tested so that you know it's adequate for you and discuss this with your, your care team. And ask about warranty, um, unit battery coverage, shipping replacements. Sometimes these systems, we call it drop shipping. They arrive on your doorstep, no education, no information. So it's really important to do your due diligence before, um, before purchasing. This is just a higher uh, picture of the way a concentrator works. Uh, so you can see here the oxygen is drawn in through this ports here. It goes through these uh, sieves, I guess you can call them, which is here, which extracts nitrogen and basically pours it back out um, as purified, more purified oxygen to the, to the patient. This is a cannula that actually, I think it's underutilized. It's called the oximizer. And it, it helps to uh, do two things. It can uh, increase the FiO2, the fracture of inspired oxygen by, by sequestering oxygen in this pendant. Um, the oxygen flows in and actually stays in here, providing a kind of a higher concentrated little reservoir. So that when you take a breath, this increases the amount of oxygen you're getting. So it can increase your battery life, I'm sorry, your tank life um, and possibly a battery. Um, so that instead of using six liters, maybe you need four or five, but it, it's not uh, designed by the manufacturer to be used with pulse systems. But I know some of you have mentioned that you've been able to do that. So all I know is that the manufacturer doesn't recommend it for pulse systems. But I will say that for our patients using an e-tank, for example, or the compressed gas, this has been helpful in allowing them to lower their flow rate and maybe have that tank last a little bit longer. So you can order these from your DME, your durable medical equipment um, company. This, I just thought I would uh, show you. These are some newer, more innovative, what they're calling uh, ventilation assist devices, tidal assist. They're kind of like a mini ventilator. Uh, um, these are cannulas that are attached to a motor uh, pressure device. And this actually has a pressure behind the oxygen delivery. So it's a little um, push, it's an assist device. And these nasal pillows, pretty much occlude your nose openings so that when this air comes in, it kind of unloads the work of breathing a bit. These have only been tested with COPD patients. So they've not been used in cystic lung disease and they're for a very specific type of patient. But I just show you, to, this is pretty innovative and it's allowed some patients to be able to exercise and be more active. Um, you can be attached or you can be, you can detach from here and use a battery and be mobile outside the home. So it's just a little uh, glimpse of other options that are coming, um, but not yet ready for patients with cystic lung disease. And flying, we touched on a bit. Flying is altitude. 
Um, cabins are pressurized to about 8,000 feet, which means you're breathing, you know, less oxygen. It's 21% on, um, on the, you know, sea level. So FPOCs are allowed. Um, but again, I would tell you to prepare in advance and you need to check with your airline's uh, medical office online at least a month in advance of your flight. There's sometimes paperwork specific to the airline. Uh, you may need to carry a doctor's prescription, even though it says that your POC is FAA approved. Um, it's always better to be prepared and have a couple copies of an order, check with them ahead, fill out the, the forms for the airlines, which physicians may have to sign. Um, so give us plenty of time in the, in the clinic setting and offices and make sure you're able to fly you know, no, no cardiac events, no cardiac history. You've talked to your physician. You know what your oxygen levels might be. Um, we can actually test you at altitude simulation. It's called a high altitude stimulation test. So we can actually simulate altitude in the PFT lab and have you breathe in lower levels of oxygen temporarily and check your blood levels. And we can pretty much estimate what we think your um, oxygen levels would be at flight and recommend if you need to have supplemental oxygen or not. So some general safety things, and, and, and again, this is, everyone's different. We don't know where you're living, how mobile you are, um, what you're doing day to day. So it is very much, imp it's important to individualize for yourself. So a general safety for oxygen um, users would be no oil-based products. And there are certain things which are designed for the nose when irritated. No open flames when you're using oxygen. Smoking, obviously. Tripping, a big issue. There are fractured hips, legs, et cetera. Um, be very careful. And I would highly recommend there's a website um, called No Person Left Behind. It's a disaster preparedness. And it has a whole section just for oxygen users. And it really encompasses safety as well as being prepared. And they include notifying your local uh, fire department that you are a, a home with oxygen in there so that if they had to come, they would know that you have, you know, 20 e-tanks stored in your garage uh, or whatever. But this, this website is very thoughtful um, for oxygen users and considering um, issues like having backup cylinders, you know, between the fires, uh, power outages, earthquakes, et cetera. Um, it's important to be prepared and, and have what we call the to-go bag. So you're, you're ready, um, particularly as an oxygen user, it's important. So education, I think there's some great educational resources now for oxygen users. We really want you to get instruction. We also really want you to go to a pulmonary rehab program if it's appropriate for you. It's a great place to get education on all aspects of your lung problem, um, especially a, a venue to test oxygen and learn more about it. Um, we've mentioned being tested on your own equipment. It's really critical to learn about the importance of that exercise. I can't emphasize this enough. Um, however you do it for whatever works for you um, is critical. It's, it's, a, it's a real deal breaker when it comes to our symptom management attack. Uh, it's, it's a key, key part of that. And I think the other thing I wanted to emphasize are what we call expectations. It's very important to have these discussions when you're considering um, with your care provider starting oxygen, um, to be clear about what and what it cannot do. Um, this was an interview study done um, on patients with different types of pulmonary fibrosis, so not LAM, but um, they, the title was a mismatch between expectation and experience. So many patients in the study reported they felt better, stronger, their heart wasn't pounding, their fingers were not so cold and blue, um, not so exhausted. Some had helped their cough, could do more things, relax, a bit of security. But the unmet expectations, I think it's important. Um, some patients thought they would be able to, quote, get back to what they were. Um, and, and the breathlessness does not go away. And that was something they were surprised. They thought if they used oxygen, they would not feel short of breath again. And then, of course, you have a new burden of worrying about running out of oxygen. It's cumbersome. People look at you, perhaps, you know, they notice now there's a cannula. So it is important to talk about the pros and cons and, and what you can expect with your, with your team and, and read about it. So this, I just want to say, there's great um, 
excellent resources. I've included all of these in our in my um, resource list. So all the foundations and the American Thoracic Society, I think this is the, one of the biggest um, advances we've made with, with education. So the research side is uh, more challenging. We need data because we need data to get better reimbursement, to get better service quality for our patients. So one of the first things that I think unmasked some of these problems was this survey that um, was an online survey published in 2018 of 19, I think 1926 uh, patients with all types of lung disease. And then we asked the question, do you have problems with your oxygen? It's pretty broad. And we kind of gave some examples. And guess who's the highest here? So this was out of 887. So it was about 51% said, yes, I have problems with my oxygen. Um, and this was a breakdown of the types of patients who reported um, problems. And the types of problems, the top one was equipment not working, travel, delivery, um, not enough tanks, lack of high flow, portable system. This is a huge issue in, yeah. We asked in the survey, how many hours a day of portable oxygen you have? And the average was two to four hours, 38% had two hours or less. And then we asked how much do you want? And that's what's in blue. And you can see that 66% of this patients wanted five or six hours, which is pretty reasonable to have a life. Uh, so other research, we recently had a virtual meeting for our American Thoracic Society. And um, I presented on what we call Nursing Year in Review, and I was asked to select some key publications in the past year. So one I've, I chose was our clinical practice guideline. So what this is, was a, a, a panel of experts that, in, that performs a very rigorous <clears throat> review. It's a very specific, oops, sorry, went back one there. A very specific, um, we asked five questions, you know, should oxygen be prescribed for a patient with interstitial lung disease who has exertion only hypoxemia? And then a, a medical librarian and a methodologist, they take off and do an exhaustive review. And the basis of the guideline is to report recommendations based on what data we have. So it doesn't mean that, that um, it shouldn't be recommended. It's just that we have to make a statement based on the literature that exists. So we only looked at patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and um, interstitial lung disease, which is pulmonary fibrosis. And in, in summary, we found the evidence varied a great deal. It's, it's very clear for patients if you have low oxygen at rest, we know that data. It is less clear, as I mentioned earlier, for patients who only desaturate with exertion. So we need more data on that. And that's in process, so we can look forward to that. But these studies take a huge amount of energy and, and time. The other I just wanna to highlight to represent just the general interests uh, in telemedicine, technology and device development. This was a group in Japan that looked at a telemonitoring system where they had a concentrator was designed and rigged. It was connected to a, a server that the physician could sign on and see the patient's use of the concentrator, their leader flow, their saturations. Um, I have a picture here. So here, the green is using oxygen at a little bit less than two liters. The yellow is using it at two liters. Black is no oxygen. These are days, these are the dates, and this is the hours of the day. So the, the clinician can look at this picture and see right away this person's using two liters most of every day. They turned it down a little bit and they were off a few times. So they have this nice pie chart. But over here, they're looking at their saturation. So here they can see this patient, even though they were using two liters, their saturation was below 90 and their heart rate was up a little bit, but mainly they can see this patient's saturations was down in the 80s. So this would prompt them perhaps to talk to the patient, maybe revisit increasing their oxygen prescription. Um, but I just thought this is an example of, I think what we're gonna see a lot more of 
um, with all sorts of technology. So I wanna bring to a close um, just some ongoing research because I, I really think it's important for all of you to know how much research is being done um, for you, for those of you that are using oxygen. It's a, it's a high interest area right now. Um, particularly, the, you can see the list here. So the first one's just portable oxygen concentrators, um, improvements in physical activity, usage, and quality of life. These are COPD. These are ongoing studies. Comparative study of three different POCs during a walk. Comparison of supplemental oxygen by continuous versus demand flow. This one was published. And they actually found about 20% of patients um, did not have equal delivery on pulse systems. And then this is a, 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 an ambulatory oxygen trial that's, that's in process to look at oxygen, portable oxygen or no portable oxygen for patients who desaturate with exercise. And then this last one was looking at the issue that I addressed a little bit about using a portable POC during sleep. So this has not been published. And these all come from clinicaltrials.gov. So this is the group that's working for you. Um, this, is, this was our workshop that was also published. This is every advocacy organization you can imagine, plus more. Um, this is LAM Foundation, Pulmonary Fibrosis, Pulmonary Hypertension, American Lung, COPD, Respiratory Care, Home Care, American Thoracic Society, Advisory Roundtable. And this group uh, are well represented in being advocates. As a matter of fact, during the oxygen shortage and during COVID, this, many in this group, these foundations, wrote a letter to the White House COVID-19 Task Force to address the shortage. They also were able to get a waiver of signature from deliveries of oxygen during COVID and in-person testing were waived, all because of the work of these foundations. So our goal is to keep you out of the home. Um, however, we can do it. This is your, uh, our moderator here, who will be, you'll be hearing for it again. But again, you have to individualize this. You're all very different. Um, all have very different needs, lifestyles, and, and your day-to-day -day activities. So I hope you can utilize every resource available um, to really optimize that. And I've, I've ended with these resources, which will give you these slides. So thank you very much. I'll take some questions, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. We're now going to move to the questions that were submitted earlier for Susan. And while we're doing that, if you have questions that you would like to have addressed, you can write them in the chat box. And I do see that some of you are already uh, putting some of those questions in the chat box. So we'll start with the ones that were submitted earlier, Susan. Okay. First, the first question was, my oxygen related question is, when lamp patients start with oxygen therapy, what are the, oh, pardon me, I didn't say that right. When should lamp patients start with oxygen therapy? What are the parameters of pulmonary function testing that indicate start of using oxygen? Very good question. Uh, so there are many things we look at before starting a patient on oxygen. So I would start by saying it, it, the first group would be data. So you mentioned pulmonary function. We do look at pulmonary function tests, and I would say the one marker of oxygenation would be the diffusion capacity, which is a uh, measure of how well the oxygen diffuses from the air sac into the bloodstream. And it's given as a number and as a percent of predicted which what that should be for your height, um, gender, and ethnicity. In general, we would say that when patients' diffusion capacities start to drop, um, you know, if you're at 70, 80, 90, 100 percent, we would not expect to see diffusion. Uh, I'm sorry, um, low oxygen levels. If you start to get down 50, 40, 30, yes, and this is very broad generalizations. Everyone's different. Uh, but somebody who has a 30% diffusion capacity, I would be very surprised if they didn't desaturate with exertion. 40, 50, 60, 40, yes. You know, so we look at diffusion, but it doesn't say if you need oxygen. It just says the severity of your diffusion defect. So we do PFTs. We would definitely do oxygen 
um, titration or six minute walk or some kind of a exercise test. And that's really the hallmark of our measure in assessing if you need oxygen or not. If we walk you and your levels go to the, you know, below 88%, we would have that discussion. If you're at rest and your oxygen is below 88%, it's very clear we would recommend it based on that data I shared with you earlier. Resting hypoxemia is a bigger, a bigger deal. If you only desaturate when you exercise hard, we don't know the data, but you would qualify for oxygen and it may improve your exercise capacity and we want you to be active and it may improve your breathlessness. So we would do pulmonary function tests. We would do walking tests. We would also make sure you have a physical exam there's any question about your cardiac function, we might have an echo if we have any concern of, um, of pulmonary hypertension. We would certainly ask you about your symptoms, your breathlessness. Um, so we would collect a lot of data, but probably the most important, those measures of, of uh, your oxygen levels, either by oximeter or even we might do a blood gas at rest uh, to check that. Some patients, we actually do what we call formal exercise testing, so cardiopulmonary exercise testing, because a patient may be short of breath, and we may not know if it's from your heart or your lungs. Even someone with LAM, you may have an unknown. We've had a patient who had an unknown heart defect, and it turned out it was her heart issue that was causing her, her low oxygen. So a full workup might include a formal cardiopulmonary exercise test where they you know, they hook you up with a bunch of things, put you on a bike, collect exhaled gas. So we collect a lot of data, we examine the patient, we listen to your symptoms, and then make a decision. Okay. The next question that was submitted earlier, if a patient normally requires continuous flow, is it possible to train or adapt breathing to effectively use pulse flow devices? And if one requires four liters continuous, is there some benefit to getting just two liters rather than using nothing? Mm. So the first one, I don't think you can train yourself. Pulse. It, you either trigger it or you don't. And, and it's, so I think that would be difficult. So I don't think you could have a mindset that you would have to train yourself to use a pulse device. If the pulse device is working appropriately, it should be sensitive enough to trigger when you breathe. The problem becomes when you exercise at higher levels and you're breathing more rapidly and more shallowly. That's when we see patients not triggering consistently. But in normal activity, it shouldn't be a problem. If you need four and you use two, is that better? I, don't, I can't really answer that. I mean, if you're telling me at four, you're at 90%, but at two, you're at 84%, I would be more worried unless at, you told me that at four liters, you're at 96%, and at two liters, you're at 90%, then two liters is okay. So again, you know, it really is using that oximetry data and discussing it with your physician and being tested. If you're above 90, you're, you're fine. I'm probably even above 88, but again, you're all a little bit different and you need to talk to your, your providers about that. But you don't need to be on oxygen and stay at 97. Then you're using, it's excess. You're just irritating your poor nose. So as long as you're above 90, 92, you're fine. Um, we hate to see patients sitting around on six liters you know, with a saturation of 99%. It, it, you need that. So I hope that wasn't too roundabout, but it, it would depend on where you are. <laughs> okay, let's move to the questions that are in the chat box now. First one was, do we actually have holes in our lungs from the cysts? Yes, <laughs> uh, they are cysts. They are thin walled, you know, think of a cyst as a round bubble. Maybe that's a better way to say it. It's a, it's a cyst, it's a bubble. But if it, so I, I guess if you define a hole, it's not really a hole, it's, a, it's more of an enclosed bubble. That makes sense, I don't know if that's clear. Okay. It's a bubble, it's a, it's a little round bubble sitting inside the lung, many of them. 
I can suppose you could say if it ruptured, then it would become a hole to be technical there. <laughs> okay. Next one. Is it important to have the air fly testing done before flying? Again, it depends what your, your normal saturations are. And so if you're normally not, if you're not an oxygen user and your exercise saturations are in the 90s, then no. But again, if you're borderline or have any other factors, you should discuss it with your physician. But if you're if you're down in the you know 90, 88, 90, then at altitude, you will be lower and may need oxygen. So it depends where you're starting from, I guess would be a good guide. Okay, next question. I know that my saturation drops when I am walking, but in my last test, they had to increase the oxygen from three liters to four liters. Does this mean that my lungs are getting worse with cysts? It may. So we do look at graphing, which I think you could all do this, um, pulmonary function results. Actually, in our electronic medical record, we can bring up our patient's pulmonary tests, and I can select either force vital capacity or diffusion capacity, and I can say graph. Show me. So if your oxygen needs are gradually going up, it would be logical, it would fit with a clinical picture of your, um, your pulmonary function test, like your diffusion might be declining. So it, 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 they, you tend to look at the whole picture, but it would, be, um, it would be typical to have, if you had increasing oxygen needs over time, we wouldn't be surprised to see a decreasing diffusion capacity, for example. And, and yes, that does reflect increasing lung disease. And in this case would be cystic changes or, or obstructive lung changes. Okay, what percentage of oxygen is delivered by a POC? I guess that, that question. I mean, it, the flow rates I know, but I don't know like the, like we know in a, um, they estimate, I think it's the purity is around 95 to 97%, but I'd have to confirm that. It's not 100%, but I could confirm that. I, I think it's the mid to high 90s. It's a range. They, they'll vary a bit, but I, I could get back to you on that. How often do you suggest Lyme patients who use overnight supplemental oxygen be retested? Hmm. A good question. Again, I think that's a, a clinical decision. If all else is stable and you've had no changes in your oxygen levels with exertion and your PFTs are stable, I think it'll be up to your clinician. But if you're starting to see changes in those other parameters, then I would probably get retested. That's a, that's a clinical decision. What level of oxygen is the concentrator able to achieve? I guess that's similar to a previous question. Yeah, I, I think it's I, I, somewhere around 96 to 97, but I, I'll have to check. When you talk about team, what is a team for treatment? I have only seen one person, a pulmonologist. <laughs> well, that varies. Could I insert this? Susan is different from everybody else that we deal with. Yeah. <laughs> I have never had the kind of test that she describes. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a good, so the basics, I mean, you know, I, our team, you know, I think of, um, there's, you know, a, a, a team might include a medical assistant that does testing, a, a nurse in the clinic, your physician, pulmonary rehab, you know, it, so that's kind of my, my team. Um, I, I, I just use the word in general. But any lamb patient at any, in any care uh, setting should have tracking of pulmonary function levels, oxygen levels, exertional oxygen levels on a regular basis, whether that's annual, and it's very individual again. And some patients, we might do it every six months or once a year, but that provider, whether it's a provider or a team, um, I think that's a, a standard of to track your breathing function, oxygen levels. And, and you know, some patients with LAM, as you all know, are 
20 years stable. Others progress differently. So it's very individual. And I would reach out to the Lamb Foundation and it, with any questions and, and other Lamb care centers. Excuse me, Char, are we running out of time? Do we continue? Yep, let's take a couple of more and then we'll circle back um, and bring those other questions up and continue it after okay. the next section. Thanks, Bev. Okay, the next question. I use the oxygen for flying and exercise. This is a good one. Are they working on developing smaller, lighter, and stronger machines? <laughs> also, any thoughts on devices that make it less obvious, the cannula, such as glasses? Oh, I didn't show my picture of glasses. There are glasses. They're called oxy, oxy light, oxy glass. I think it's oxy glass, um, O-X-Y. They, uh, I think the and they're actually very attractive. I mean, they really hide it. The cannula goes into the frame. And I, I think the, the only restriction is it's not very high flow. And I, I can't recall if they go to two or three and it doesn't work on pulse, but, but they do have that. Lighter devices, we are pounding away. Bev is pounding away. This is an area of research. We're trying to get funding. That big group of people I showed you, there is some huge effort to try um, and get lighter, longer lasting, and especially higher flow because the high patients are really, I think, really isolated because of the, their systems. Um, technology is, is, is trying. Um, you know, we do have fancy, uh, I didn't mention that, we do have fancy uh, oximeters now, Apple, not Apple, there's a ring, actually Bev will talk about that. So there is better technology with oximetry, but not our, our oxygen equipment. So I, we are trying. That's all I can tell you. It's it's a big a big advocacy effort. Okay, last Ever. question for now. One more. Okay. One more. What yep. Thanks. Of, what type of inhaler to use and when? That's that's a clinical question. Yeah. We, we would base that on um, if you have what we call reactive airway disease or asthma or and that's based on pulmonary function testing and other clinical. We, you know, do breathing tests before you use an inhaler, a bronchodilator, and then we would give you a bronchodilator, and then we would repeat, repeat the breathing test and see if your airflow um, increases by a certain percent, and you would have, yes, you have asthma or reactive airway disease, which is not unusual in LAM, but it, that's a clinical testing and, and a clinical decision. Okay, thank you very much, Susan. Okay, thank Back you. Back to you, Shar. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Susan. Great questions, everyone. Thank you. And we will come back um, to the chat box with Susan and our other speakers in, in just a little bit. I'm going to uh, go ahead and hopefully bring up my, my screen here. Can you all see that? shift some things around. All right. Um, for those of you familiar with Lamposium in your living room, um, you'll be familiar with the term patient spotlight. Um, those of you attending for the first time, this is an opportunity for us to um, focus and meet some of the women in our community. And this evening's spot, patient spotlight focuses on our next speakers, three women living with LAM, all of whom are actively engaged with the foundation and are passionate and committed advocates for improved oxygen delivery systems. Beverly Jackson was diagnosed with LAM in 2005 and prescribed oxygen for exertion at that same time. Bev has also volunteered as a LAM liaison for nearly 10 years. Patricia Ortiz was diagnosed with LAM in 2011 and prescribed oxygen for high level exertion and use at altitude in 2012. She's volunteered as a LAM liaison from 2013 through 2017. Mary Stojic was diagnosed with LAM in 1998 and now requires supplemental oxygen only when at altitude or while traveling by plane. Mary has volunteered as a LAM liaison since the inception of our liaison program in 2008. Bev and Patricia first met as roommates at the National Institutes of Health, NIH, in 2012. They found they shared an interest in improved portable oxygen devices, systems that would be lighter weight and that would offer higher continuous flow options for their incredibly active lifestyles. In 2017, both women attended the Patient Benefit Conference in Los Angeles and participated in the Oxygen Study Group 
tasked with identifying improvements that A, could be accomplished in the next five years, and B, would improve the quality of life for women living with LAM. Ultimately, that study group decided to explore options for a remote control device that would address the difficulties oxygen users face when needing to adjust their oxygen flow rates, whether changing level of exertion at home or away from home while using a portable device. Alongside the concept of a remote control device, the study group identified broader, more critical improvements that would reduce the physical limitations that exist for many oxygen users. The need for a lightweight portable device which delivers continuous flow and operates using long lasting lighter weight batteries and ideally a remote control or app for easy adjustment of flow rates. Well, let's fast forward now to January, 2020. Beverly is back at the NIH and attending the Tuesday group meeting with Dr. Moss and the region's LAM liaison, Mary Stojic. Mary inquired as to the progress on the recommendations of the oxygen study group. As not much progress had yet been made, Dr. Moss mentioned that the small business awards offered by the NIH might be an option worth exploring. And hence, the mighty team of three was formed, with Mary joining Beverly and Patricia in their quest to advance oxygen delivery technology. Since then, the trio has spent countless hours collaborating to formalize user needs and to develop a high-level project plan that outlines for potential developers what it would take to, improve, to produce improved portable oxygen delivery systems. This project remains a work in progress. The team is hoping for an update on potential funding before the end of the year. In closing, as part of the patient spotlight, we ask individuals to provide a quote or mantra meaningful to them that we can share with all of you. This next slide is the quote that the ladies um, selected and it, and it summarizes beautifully why they do what they do. It's the action, not the fruit of the action, that's important. You have to do the right thing. It may not be in your power, may not be in your time that there'll be any fruit, but that doesn't mean you stop doing the right thing. You may never know what results come from your action, but if you do nothing, there will be no results. And that comes of course from Mahatma Gandhi. So I would like at this point to, um, we will bring up uh, the presentations that these ladies have prepared. These are pre-recorded and um, should come up here just a second. In close. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no worries, Caroline. Um, the the video is coming up. Um, okay. Are you are you seeing? Yeah. So you got the the right screen is up. Okay, it comes the... up because it keeps going away on my screen. So I didn't know if you could see it or not. Yeah, we can see the video come up. Um, we'll try this again. Tell me. Just give me a yes or no. Thank you. The screen. Yep. Can you see the screen? I can see your screen. Yes. Okay. All right. You got it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Beverly Jackson. I was diagnosed with LAM in 2005. And at that same time, I was given a prescription for oxygen, for exertion, and for flying. At that time, I knew absolutely nothing about oxygen. So my goal is to encourage women to get educated about oxygen before they actually need it. This might help in getting you the kind of equipment that's needed and also support your lifestyle. What I'm going to do is share some of the things that I've learned over the years. A lot of women with LAM are prescribed oxygen for exertion. When I heard that term, I thought that meant extreme exertion, like running a marathon. Well, what I've learned is it can be very simple things like talking, 
toweling off, making a bed, picking up a toddler, walking across the room, and then more things that are really exertion, like exercise, playing sports, walking up a flight of stairs, or taking a long walk. Let's start with what the oxygen supply company gives you when you're brought the oxygen. It will be an oxygen concentrator, a, a stationary one that plugs into the wall. They come in two varieties, a five liter maximum or a 10 liter, and both of those are continuous flow um, settings. They'll also give you 25 feet or 50 feet of tubing that can be strung around your house so you can move freely while you're connected to the concentrator. That causes a problem because your tubing is going to catch on the furniture, and in my case, it was catching on the refrigerator. So, a good suggestion was brought by um, Karen and Brian Kinsey. You can use this, can't find where it is, this plastic coil that you can wrap around your tubing and that keeps it from catching on different things throughout your house. You need to place your concentrator in a room where you're not using it because it's going to produce a lot of heat and a lot of noise. Next, we'll move on to the cannulas. You can bring up my next slide. There are a lot of different cannulas, soft ones, long prongs, short prongs, high flow ones. This slide is showing you, hopefully you can tell the difference of what a short prong and a long prong is. Um, you need to just try out different ones to see what works best for you. What I do when I go to my PFTs on my six minute walk, I ask them to give me the cannulas because they're gonna throw them away anyway. And then you have some different varieties that you can try. Also get the paper that comes with the cannula. So if you end up liking them, you can order them on your own. After a time, that palms in your nose are going to get um, hard. So you need to change them out at least once a month. And if you do have the problem of them irritating your nose, the next slide shows a nasal gel that you can use to kind of ease that pain. In addition to the concentrator, the oxygen supply company is required to give you some devices that will work when you're active outside the home. There's probably gonna be tanks. And there are a lot of different kind of tanks. The oxygen company will probably want to provide you with the E-tanks because they don't have to give you quite as many. I prefer the smaller tanks. And you can see in the background some of the tanks that I use. And the slide that you're going to be seeing now shows these different tanks. And one more. Shows the different tanks, shows you how big they are, how much they weigh. I use the M9 tanks so I can give you what the ratings are on how long they will last. If I let, set it at a continuous setting of two, that M9 will last for 110 minutes. On up to, if I have it at a six continuous, it only lasts 20 minutes. On the next slide, it shows you a variety of tanks and how long they will last, both on pulse dosage and on con continuous dosage. I know you can't read all of that on that screen, so on the next slide, I've given you what the web address is if you want to be able to study that later. Okay. I use a finger pulse like was shown earlier, but I've always wanted to be able to record what my stats are whenever I'm uh, active. And if you see the next slide, it shows this device called an O2 ring. And someone on our Lammy's Facebook uh, page posted this. I can't remember who. 
what I like about it, I've used it to record my stats when I'm walking, when I'm playing tennis, and when I am sleeping. And you can connect it with Bluetooth to your phone so you can see after the activity what your stats were, how they've gone up and down. You can also download the information to your um, computer in the form of a spreadsheet if you want to. What this device does, when you're active and you drop below the 89%, it will vibrate on your finger to let you know you need to make some kind of an adjustment. Okay, that's all on that slide. Um, I said that I like to be hands, I don't need that slide yet. I like to be hands-free whenever I'm uh, using oxygen. And what I like to put is my M9 in a backpack. This is a sports backpack. The brand is a camel back. It's called a hydration pack. And it comes with a water bladder inside. You take the water bladder out and place your tank inside that area. It also has loops on the backpack so you can uh, thread your cannula through that and it kind of keeps the uh, tubing close to the backpack. The other feature I like on the backpacks is they have straps that go across your chest and across your waist. So whenever you're active, the backpack moves with you. It doesn't flop around while you're moving. What I suggest that you do, take your tank and go to a sporting goods store and check out their variety of backpacks. See which backpack works for your tank and your body. Then you might want to shop around to see where you can get the best price for that, that particular backpack. We all would like to have portable oxygen concentrators for our activities. However, the technology doesn't seem to be where we would like for it to be. This is a Energen G3. It weighs five pounds, including the battery. The batteries are down here in this zipper compartment. It will last for three hours at a pulse setting of two. And most of the POCs are pulse uh, delivery only. There are a few, and I'll tell you about those in a minute, that are continuous flow. The comes with a strap that you can wear it as a shoulder, or you can order a backpack that's uh, fitted for it so that it gets the ventilation. You notice that you need to have ventilation to bring the air in. It also comes with an adapter for both um, a cigarette lighter, so you can use it in the car. You can charge it while you're using it, and I see. I mean, uh, an AC adapter so you can charge it at home while you're using it if you need to. The chart you see now is a list of all of the FAA approved uh, POCs and what their weight is. On the next slide, it also shows you how long you can expect the POC to last if it's uh, on different settings. I know you probably also can't read this, so if you look there under the title of the slide, it will show you uh, the web address for this particular information. There are a few of the POCs that are continuous in the examples. The respironics simply go. It weighs about 10 pounds, and it can go up into continuous setting of two, and the battery will last at that setting for about an hour. There's a sequel eclipse that can go up to a continuous flow of three, and it weighs 18 pounds, and its battery lasts for two hours at a uh, continuous setting of two. So you notice that the weight of those, you won't be carrying them on your back or on your shoulder. They come with a cart that you will pull the device along with you. I get concerned when somebody is going to 
get a POC purchase out of pocket because you need to assess what your needs for oxygen are right now and what you may need in the future to see if that's going to be lasting you for any length of time. And before you actually purchase the POC, you should try to try it out. Either get one from your oxygen supplier or you can rent different types to see what you think is going to best fit your needs. My last slide is about flying with oxygen. There's a fellow Lammy, Sarah Potras, who has a blog called Travel, Breathe, Repeat. And in that blog, she talks about all different kinds of airlines she's flown at. She's flown extensively, both domestic and international. And she has a list of airlines, probably ones you've never heard of, and gives you tips of how you deal with uh, each one of those airlines. Thank you very much. I hope uh, you have questions later for us. Hi, I'm Patricia, and I was diagnosed with LAM in the beginning of 2012. And I used to race bicycles, and one of the first things I really missed was being able to do some of these really um, sprint exercises and really hard workouts that I no longer am able to do um, outdoors when I don't carry oxygen with me. So uh, fast forward in 2013, I got a prescription of oxygen, supplemental for um, exercise at high exertion level, and also for travel or for being at altitude. So uh, today I want to demonstrate how you can set up your bike. That could be a stationary bike, that could be your own bike on a trainer system, and how you can set up your oxygen with that to have an effective workout just like you did before. So uh, let's get started. For the oxygen, I'm using uh, one of those e-cylinders with compressed oxygen in it. And uh, one of the hacks I did, what I really didn't like is the nasal cannulas because not only uh, were they uncomfortable, but also uh, they didn't work for me because I'm not a nose breather. When I work out at high exertion levels, I'm a mouth breather. So what I did is I cut these two nasal cannulas open. I just put this in my mouth during the exercise, set it up, tighten it. And this is my, this is my setup when I work out. I just wanted to share that with you because some of you may have experienced the same problem, which is also one of the reasons why I can't use portable oxygen concentrators because that pulse just doesn't sync with my breathing rhythm. So I find myself still exerted. I can't do the hard workout that I used to do. So I need continuous flow, which is my uh, e-cylinder here and this nasal cannula just uh, kind of modified so I can breathe through my mouth. Um, another thing I want to show you, of course, for those who need um, more concentrated oxygen and uh, need a high oxygen flow, you can always use that mask, the face mask. Um, this is for medium concentration. I got that as well, but I found myself that I really don't like the feeling of having a mask on my mouth when I do a hard workout, but I just want to show that to you. So let me share with you um, how I get on my bike, how I set up, how I do the exercise. And one other piece I want to introduce to you, I use a, a pulse oximeter during the exercise to just uh, gauge how I'm doing. Um, I have one from Massimo and that's specifically good for exercise because it records not just your oxygen concentration level, but also a bunch of other parameters such as your breathing rate, uh, your pulse rate. It also has a, a signal in here that tells you when your perfusion rate, which is the blood flow in your finger where you measure the oxygen concentrate level, is too low. Because when you have too low of a level, your reading will not be accurate. It will be inaccurate low. So this gives me an idea of um, my oxygen level, some other parameters, and the nice thing with this is, it is equipped with a Bluetooth, and it connects to a really nice app. So if I do a workout, I can actually um, measure and um, record all my measurements on this uh, app and I can look at the history reading later. So, let me get started. So, this is just a setting uh, as 
I would have when I normally ride outdoors, just with the difference that it's hooked up uh, to this, uh, to this uh, trainer here, and it gives me some level of resistance that changes when I switch my gears. sprint exercise, I use normally uh, a liter of four, four or six. I turn this on. And here we go. I wait for my reading. I get to that. So I am Mary Stojic from Maryland. My first lamb symptom was a collapsed lung requiring surgery at age 21 in 1985, but I wasn't diagnosed until age 34 when the other lung collapsed requiring surgery in 1998. Although I am short of breath on exertion, I only require oxygen during air, tra air travel or when I'm at high elevation. As I do not desat during exercise, I only learned that I desaturated elevation when in, in airplanes when I monitored my saturation rate using a, just a pulse, finger pulse oximeter during two different flights and a trip to a town over 7,200 feet. When my rate dropped below 90, I was surprised and checked to verify that my fingers were not cold and tried again. With this information, my doctor was concerned about my planned vacations with long flights to Australia and New Zealand. Even though I had heard many stories from my lamb sisters, the experience of planning airline travel with oxygen was quite eye-opening. First, there was the question of the actual portable oxygen concentrator, the POC equipment. My doctor very generously loaned me an Inogen G3 with a cart for the trip. I had arranged for the extra batteries required for the 12 plus hours of the flight, as airlines require 150% of the flight time equivalent for battery time. After researching the, and the, the renting versus purchasing options, I opted to buy used batteries. It was easier and more cost effective and I didn't have to interface with my insurance company, saving hours and headache. As I do not use oxygen at home after the trip, I gifted the extra batteries to my doctor. The second time consuming activity was contacting the airlines, domestic and international, to arrange the paperwork required to bring a POC on a flight. My pulmonologist also had to complete some documentation, some of it quite detailed. I carried several copies of this paperwork just in case there was a problem. Much of it went unused, but a few times it was very helpful. The need for smaller and lighter oxygen devices became quite apparent during these vacations. It is difficult enough to travel when short of breath on exertion, pulling and carrying luggage through enormous airports, but the added weight of the POC and extra batteries took that much more effort. Security added its own stress. On occasion, the equipment had to be explained and the large quantity of batteries caused its own questions and raised eyebrows. I viewed the stressful situations as opportunities to educate security officials about LAM and oxygen uses. I also quickly learned it is important to organize all the needed supplies, batteries, cannulas, Purell, tissues, etc., to be within easy reach during flight. I sat in the window seat so the POC could be at my feet without obstructing others. When it was time to change the batteries, I felt like a contortionist. Breathing while bent over to adjust the flow rate, check the battery life, or the dreaded battery change was not comfortable. 
I can't imagine what it would, would be like to haul the POC to the restroom during the flight in such cramped quarters. I have started using a watch style health monitor, which includes a pulse oximeter and a blood pressure reading from one of the magazine companies to monitor my saturation levels as it records periodically while I'm awake, exercising, sleeping, and on demand when interfacing with my cell phone for future reference. The daily recorded highs and lows allow me to track giving the peace of mind and information for my doctor. I'm grateful to everyone that has helped me along the way for just the small amount of supplemental oxygen use I have experienced. Wow, a lot of information, right? <laughs> Um, thank you to our um, three uh, women who compiled that, that uh, video for us. And I think we'll bring those three ladies and Susan back for some Q&A, right? As that video was going up, I saw a lot of questions flying into the, the chat box. And we also had some questions that were submitted um, prior to this evening as well. So I'm going to um, adjust my screen a little bit here so I can see everyone. And again, thank you, um, all of you, for putting all of this together. Um, I'm going to start with one of the questions that uh, came in ahead of time. And I will uh, put this out to Patricia. Um, trying to find you on my screen here. Patricia, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me well? Um, this person uh, that submitted a question was asking, um, they wanted to hear directly from an oxygen supplier as to which portable oxygen concentrators can be powered in flight by the outlet on an airplane, not using their batteries. Um, she explains that she's personally booked a first class flight for access to the outlet on several airlines, airlines and found the wattage was not sufficient to power her POC and this was a simply go. Um, she's heard that the Inogen G4 can be powered by an in-flight electrical outlet. They would like confirmation from this and also looking for actual wattage statistics from the suppliers. Now, that's, that's a bucket full of questions there, but um, you have some insight for us on that. Yes, um, so I do have some insight, but unfortunately, I would not know about the Inogen 1G4 specifically. Um, I have the Inogen 1G5 and uh, I looked it up in the manual actually and it talks about the ability to use it um, charging on uh, within the airline. However, they um, say to remove the battery from the Inogen 1G5 here and then you use the DC power plug uh, to connect. However, I can tell from my experience, um, I have flown a lot for work and um, on two occasions when I, when I tried to charge it, it actually didn't work. And I was told that sometimes they disable it certain times and it's sometimes on, sometimes off. And uh, throughout the plane, they turn it off in one section, turn it on in the other. So it's not very consistent. So I did not find it very useful. Um, in terms of finding out if a specific manufacturer allows their device to be charged, I would always contact the manufacturer because there's so many different models out there that it's best to get that information from them directly. But I do know about the Inogen 1G5 that allows this, but I would not rely on the capability to charge it during flight. Great, very insightful. Thank you, Patricia, great information. Another question that was submitted in advance um, pertains to a type of a, a boosting device, if you will. And I'll um, maybe by you, one of the four of you can just raise your hand if you'd like to take this. Is, is there a new regulator that provides a boost of oxygen um, when my Inogen POC senses that the flow setting is too low for my current needs? And if so, so a two-parter, if the boost were too strong, could it cause any harmful effects? So um, Patricia, I can speak to um, actually a test I did. Um, I did a trial with one of these devices uh, that pushes um, the oxygen into your lungs. And it helped me tremendously to help with the inhale when I exercise at a really high exertion level. However, when I contacted my pulmonologist, 
So it's very individual, right? I'm very prone to lung collapses. Even after prodesis, I get small collapses and they actually recommended for me not to use it, but it's, I think, an individual situation. I would agree with that. I think it's the ones that I showed the pictures of, they're called tidal assists, and they have this bolus that, that's pressure behind it, and it's not been tested in patients with cystic lung disease. So I, it would be a good discussion before using it. Yeah, I agree. Chat box here. Um, any advice for preventing nosebleeds due to oxygen usage? I know Bev, you you mentioned the um, ointment there the error or previously. Anyone have any experience with nosebleeds or? I would strongly recommend that there's a couple of, of lubricants. I saw air was on Bev's slide. They're very helpful. And the other piece is just whenever you can keep your oxygen at the lowest needed level flow rate um, and of course humidified if you're at higher flow rates but all of you may have better tips but it's a it's an ongoing issue especially at higher flow rates and continuous use i think also changing the cannula often mm. because if you let it get real hard it's going to irritate your nose more right good point Another one in the chat box again, and I think we've addressed this just a little bit, but any additional thoughts? Are there handheld POCs being worked on with constant flow, continuous flow? I know you've mentioned that the ones now are very heavy. I don't need oxygen at rest, but when I start walking or moving at work, it fluctuates and goes low even with the POC, um, but I don't want to have heavy tanks when I'm mostly sitting. Any suggestions? and added my FEV1 is 90%, but diffusion capacity is at 55%. I don't guess there's any handheld POCs out there right now. Yeah, I mean, we just, this is a, such a, a pressing issue for so many people to stay mobile and this person working, you know, it, so there is, no, there is no handheld. I mean, the smallest POC you can have. I have had patients um, get a second stationary, smaller one and put it under their desk at work. Um, that doesn't solve the problem of moving around, um, but that way they have higher flow when, there's, when they're needed, but it doesn't attack that, that portable challenge. Evan, you're... Uh, presentation you showed the Inogen uh, that your small portable which one is that and it, and is that about the smallest one out there mine no I think mine's an Inogen G3 I think the G4 is a little lighter weight than the G3 maybe in the two to three pound uh, range mine was a five pound one question from our chat box. I have heard there are sport watches now that check oxygen levels. Any specific you recommend? I know with oximeter, your arm needs to be still. And so we had a couple of devices shown um, in the presentations. Mary, do you have something different from? Yeah, I actually have one on this black band. I got it. It's pretty recent. I just I found it in a hammer and slimmer catalog oh. <laughs> by Smart Health. And I mean, I don't know how accurate it is but the nice thing is at the end of the day it gives me a high and a low and so since I'm not real low in my saturations it just is a good way for me to kind of keep track to make sure that things are staying where they're at so and the nice thing is I can set it to take it, it takes a couple of things it also does blood pressure which is kind of good um, and it'll do it every hour or every 15 minutes and I can actually ask it to take that measurement as well and I just wear it and it does it while I'm moving around. I don't, I don't pretend that I think it's 100% accurate, but I'm not looking for that. I just need to know if I'm in a good range or not. So what I suggest also, just about every one of the devices, you can have a trial period on it. And I have ordered several different things thinking that they might do the recording I was looking for and they didn't work the way I want them to, and I just send them back. You gotta be persistent though on sending those things back because they're expensive. 
And, and I should say the other really interesting thing about this watch, like a bunch of the others, it actually interfaces with my phone and stores that information there, which makes it easier to get to. But I still use my finger oximeter. Um, it still comes in handy, just that basic technology. And then we have a question, Bev. This is one's for you in here. Um, Bev, on your POC, how do you keep the tubing straight where it connects? Mine always falls over. I think many of us can relate to uh, these tangled messes. Yeah, I, mine does too. I mean, I wish they had a shorter thing. It's hard to get those four feet uh, tubings now. And so with the seven feet, they really twist up on you. But I don't have a secret for that. I kind of uh, wrap it up and stuff it into a uh, Ziploc bag, the excess on it. Trisha, I'm, I'm reading this question here. Um, can you talk a little bit more about being a mouth breather? And um, is it just a regular can you in your mouth? Um, and, and maybe uh, explain again kind of what you do with the, the prongs on the on mm -hmm. your cannula? Yeah, sure, thank you. absolutely. So mouth breather, meaning if I do uh, really exercise at very high level, I, I breathe through my mouth. I cannot breathe through my nose. It's most often stuffed anyway. So I found the nasal cannulas are just not effective for me. And what I did is I just took that nasal cannula, I cut off these two prongs and then place it in my mouth and, and breathe in this way because I can keep my mouth halfway open uh, through exercising. Um, I tried the masks too, but for some reason um, I do sprint intervals and it just doesn't work well with me when I have something restricted on my face. So I found this to be most effective. And these are just the normal cannulas, the uh, nasal cannulas that I'm using. I would say I've had patients use it in their mouth, even without having the, the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um and, 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 I, and one patient in particular used it because of nosebleeds. So, but again, just check your saturations to make sure you're getting enough oxygen, but yeah. Uh, I don't want to pass over one of the comments in here, not a question, but it's uh, the comment that this is very helpful. So thank you, um, all of you, and good to see that in there. One, another question, and um, I'll flip this to Bev. Will insurance help pay for the O2 ring? Does anyone know if they will reimburse you? I've never tried to get insurance to pay for it, so I do not know. If you if you get the cheaper ones, you can get them for $30, something like that. That um, O2 ring I showed, I think it was like $170. And I don't know if insurance ends up having a deductible that would keep it from reimbursing something of that price. Always ask them. Um, staying on the ring then, uh, the O2 ring then, Bev. Um, is it accurate to say that this can be used while you are active and exercising or is it just for sleeping? Um, this yeah. woman is looking for something that she can use while exercising so that she knows. Um, I use it for exercise. I've used it walking, playing tennis and sleeping. And it keeps going the whole time, records. And then you can connect Bluetooth to your phone. And then from your phone, you can download it to a spreadsheet if you want to. Um, like everybody else is saying, I'm not sure it's 100% accuracy, but you get the trends. And I think the trends is what you're looking for. And it also, whenever you're active, if you drop below the 89, it vibrates on your finger to let you know that you're below the threshold there. Mary, we had a question directed at you, the same, same type of thing. Can you share the brand equipment that you got to monitor and record that interfaces with your phone? Was, that was, was the, that? this one? Yeah, that's the hammer. Uh, and I think Patricia, yours interfaces with your phone as well. Yes, mine does as well. Mine is uh, the Massimo, it's, but it's a finger pulse oximeter. 
Maybe we can type them into the chat box, ladies, if you wouldn't, oh, sure. if you wouldn't mind doing that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, scrolling through here. And somebody's commenting that they have the Apple Watch 6. This might be helpful for others, but uh, and that the not certain how accurate it is, but it does track your sleep overnight. Um, and then they, yeah, we're looking for the name of the watch and any recommendations on which app to use on an iPhone um, for recording your sets. Hmm. Anybody tried that? Um, actually, I do record the Massimo um, in has an app for iPhone or um, Android, actually, and that's why I record. But it's, I don't use the um, Apple Watch or anything. I haven't tried that. Anyone else? We have some, some great comments in here about um, one woman saying that she uses a little cord detangler made for her phone to keep the tubing from falling over. I don't know, maybe in the, we'll move to group discussion here, we can, we can take that up. Um, Another wonderful comment. Again, thank you to you all. This has been extremely information and very helpful. So thank you. Um, I'm, I just want to scroll here. If we don't have any more uh, questions, um, we've got the information now in there, everyone, on these the watches um, and the, the devices. Here's one. Um, any suggestion on how sleeping with O2, um, on how to sleep with it? I often lose the cannula or maybe <laughs> snore, <laughs> not breathe through the night. Um, Anyone have suggestions on, or maybe each of you could share, um, and Susan, you may know tips from others. Uh, how do you keep that cannula comfortable at night and on your, and keep it on yourself? Yeah. Mary, can we start with you? Oh, oh wait, you don't sleep, you don't sleep, use it at night, right? I, I've, yep, I'm going to the top of my screen. Patricia, how about you? I'm not using it at night either. I only use it for high level exertion and altitude, so Bev. when I move. Okay, I just raise that little thing up and choke myself with it so it doesn't fall off of my, my nose. And then I've gotten where I think when I turn over, I just am in the habit of grabbing hold of the cannula and turning it with me. The two are your face using paper tape. Um, I know I've heard some women that's, and this is something I did years ago, they slept with the cannula behind my head and latched it back here. Um, I don't know, Susan, do you have any tips you've learned from oxygen no. users? No, <laughs> but going behind sometimes is helpful for, for, for a variety of things. Yeah, I was forever waking up with it on. So I think we're at, I'm just going to do a time check here. Um, any last, we'll take a last call for questions. And otherwise we can, uh, what we'll do for a group discussion is we do stop the recording. So everyone hopefully can bring their, turn their cameras on and stay on and participate. And just an opportunity to hear from some additional patients, Bev, I believe. Okay.